Hey everyone, Pastor John here. Uh, excited to be doing another Dive Deeper with you. Uh, obviously, this is a very big week for us as we look ahead to Jesus' resurrection and celebrating that uh, with each of you on Sunday. Now, when I think about this week and I reflect on all the things that happened during this week, just those 2,000 years ago, it makes me wonder, what could have happened between Palm Sunday when the people were crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, singing praise to God and saying, save us, save us, between that day and his triumphal entry into Jerusalem and Friday when the people, those same people actually were crying out, crucify him, crucify him, and even being willing to receive the punishment for his execution on themselves and even to their children. What are the things that happened on Monday and Tuesday and through the rest of the week? What did Jesus do that might have changed the, the mentality or the mindset of the people that they would turn so quickly against him? Well, this week, as we uh, prepare for a good Friday service, Friday evening, and Easter service Sunday morning, we're going to spend some time every other day diving into what happened on those days that brought about this change of events and this change of uh, attitude and, and uh, perception toward Christ. I hope that as we spend this time in the Word that you'll learn something new, that it reveals some things about Jesus, but also challenges you in your walk. Because Jesus, obviously, in his last days, he knew that his time was coming, and he did not pull any punches. He, did not, um, he didn't let there uh, exist any doubt around what his purpose was and what his message was. So let's go ahead and dive in. Today is Monday, so what did Jesus do that Monday before his crucifixion? So that day, as he uh, woke up, Remember, he had just come into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. He wakes up and he's heading into the temple. But on his way to the temple, he sees a fig tree. And this fig tree has leaves on it. And uh, it's not the season for the fig trees to have leaves or fruit at this time. And Jesus knows it. But when he sees the tree that it has leaves, it's an indication that it should have fruit. But because the tree does not have fruit, Jesus curses the tree. And as we'll see tomorrow, uh, that, that tree withers and dies. Now, you might ask, okay, what's the application for us? I think we have to remember, like I said, that as Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, what is happening? The people are praising him. They are crying, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, save us. But Jesus knows that those cries of praise are fruitless. He knows that though they are showing on the outside that there might just be this loyalty and, and surrender to him, on the inside, it is selfish and is, does not produce fruit that aligns with his will or the kingdom of God. And so I think what Jesus is doing here is as he looks at this fig tree and those leaves proclaim that it should have fruit, but Jesus sees that it does not. It's a challenge to us to look at our own lives where our words might be pro professing that we are Christians. Our words might be professing that we align with God, that we worship him, but does do our lives produce the fruit that aligns with what we say about God and what we say we believe about him. Jesus cursed this fig tree because it didn't produce fruit aligned with what its proclamation was. Imagine what will happen to us if we don't do the same, if we don't produce fruit when we say that we are aligned with him. Next is Jesus goes He's heading to the temple. Now, one thing that happens is during this day also is his authority is questioned. And the people come to him, Jesus, what authority do you speak under? And Jesus, knowing their um, their intent, uh, he's, he looks at them. He says, I'll answer your question with a question. In fact, if you answer my question, I'll answer yours. He says, what authority did John the Baptist baptize under? And the people, they wouldn't, they refused to answer him because they knew that if they said, well, it was under God's authority, then Jesus would ask them why they didn't believe. Yet they, yet if they had said that it was under man's authority, the people would get upset because many looked at John the Baptist as a prophet, as someone uh, that was sent by God. And so they said, we can't answer your question. And so Jesus refused to answer theirs. Now, from here, he heads into the temple, and this is honestly, I think, um, a widely misunderstood passage of Scripture. People look at this, and they see Jesus, you know, pulling together a whip and driving the people out because they're money changers. And, you know, he says, my house, uh, it is written that my house will be a house of prayer, and you have made it into a den of thieves. And certainly we know that uh, there are prophecies about Christ having zeal for God's house. There are prophecies about uh, just the way that he would, um, you know, have that passion about the temple. And we also know that the temple was a, a sacred place. It was where uh, the people would go uh, for uh, to submit their uh, sacrifices for their sin and then for all of the other things that they would need to do. 
But what I think we need to understand is that in all of this, Jesus is giving us an illustration almost similar to what we saw with the fig tree. Because what's happening is these money changers, they are selling the hope. They are selling forgiveness. They are saying, come change your money. Come buy the sacrifice. And they're the people's hope. And it was they were putting their hope in the sacrifice itself, not in the prayer or the, the prayer that was offered up to God for that grace and forgiveness. How do we know this? Well, if we look at the prophecies um, that Jesus fulfilled, he actually fulfilled two prophecies in this one act. Um, we actually learn a little bit about this. So when Jesus says, it is written that my house will be a house of prayer, he's quoting from Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 56, verses um, uh, 5 through 7, it says this, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called the house of prayer for all peoples. What Jesus is showing is that in this place, in his temple, that is where the people would come together to surrender to God, united. And not just notice that it's it's not just the Jews, it is all people. And it's interesting as we look at this, that the rules and the, the segregation that had to have been happening and the way that the even the religious people were separating themselves or even not allowing others to come in and participate in the grace of God, but also putting their hope in the work instead of the prayer. Because Jesus says, or Isaiah says, that it, his house would be a house of prayer for people to come together under the name of the Lord. And we see that this must not have been happening in this moment. And so Jesus says, my house is supposed to be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. So den of thieves comes from Jeremiah chapter 7. And again, it's another um, very provocative and, and sharpening um, I think, warning from Jesus. It says this, starting in verse eight, behold, you must trust, behold, you trust in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal and go after other gods that you have not known and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name and say, we are delivered only to go on doing all of these abominations. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes. Behold, I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. Wow. Jesus, he, he's basically, um, or God is, is basically through the prophet Jeremiah, he's saying to the, to the people in Israel, because they're getting ready to go into exile, he says, you're going into, ex into exile because you're putting your hope in the work. You're putting your hope in your life. He says, you come and you try to worship me, but you live your life the way that you want to every other day of the week. He says, how can you do that? You're turning my house into a den of thieves because you're trying to rob me. You're trying to uh, just deceive me. You're, you're acting violently toward me. And I think the challenge for us is the same, that Jesus would say, are we going into his temple? Are we going in, not just into the body of the church, but the body of Christ? Are we coming in as fellow Christians, trying to live the way that we want to live every single day of the week? And yet cry out to him and say, we are delivered, we are delivered, simply because we raise our hands in worship and cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna. I think this is what just impassioned Jesus that day is realizing that the people were putting their hope not in him, not in grace, not in God, but just in the fact that they identified themselves as believers or followers of God rather than the grace that God offers. So my challenge to you today is this. Let your life produce fruit that keeps with repentance. It says that in Matthew chapter three. Let your life produce fruit that keeps with repentance. And the praise and the offerings that you give to God and worship, let your life produce fruit that aligns with the proclamation of worship that you give to him. Let your life be a living sacrifice of worship to him. Everything that you do, surrendered to God, everything that you are, surrendered to him and watch him make a difference in your life. Watch him use you to make a difference in this world. God bless you as you dive deeper into his word every day.